Welcome to recordings from We the People, Race in America, the Calvin Center for Faith and Writing's 2016 Fall Writer Series. In this series of five events, people from diverse backgrounds, working in different genres, read or performed their work and then discussed it with attentive audiences. What follows is the fifth and final event in that series, fiction writer Peter Ho Davies, reading from his novel, The Fortunes, and discussing Chinese American immigrant experiences. Recorded in the Ladies Literary Club in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan on December 8, 2016. A note for our listeners, this recording does include content and strong language that might not be suitable for children. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I should say, actually, the one thing that Larry probably didn't mention, uh, I, I always feel the need to explain my accent before a reading. Um, uh, so, so the accent you're hearing is British. There was a time years ago uh, when I read uh, somewhere and my Britishness was not mentioned in advance. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, oh, where are you from? I explained I was from Britain. Uh, they said, oh, I noticed you had an accent, but I thought it might just be an affectation. Uh, so I always like to clear that up in case anybody is wondering about that. Um, I should also say that the other old joke that I tell is... Um, that if, it, you know, during the course of the reading, my pronunciation seems at all strange, it's just that it's correct. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm going to read uh, a section from this novel. Um, there are some funny bits, but this is not the funniest bit. There are some jokes in it. I'm going to tell some uh, bad ethnic jokes um, uh, that target uh, Asians and Asian Americans to some degree. Uh, but it's okay to laugh because I, it's okay for me to tell them, all right? So I want to encourage you to feel that you can do that. And, uh, you know, although I, I actually do have the book with me here, because I'm now old, apparently, and my eyesight is not good, I have to read from, you know, the large print edition, which is the manuscript. Um, so this is a section called Fast as Lightning. It's the third section in the book. I'm reading it in part because it is a Michigan set section. Uh, it deals with a uh, hate crime that took place in, uh, uh, in Michigan in Detroit in 1982, the Vincent Chin case some of you may have heard of. Um, and I'm going to try and read a... Um, uh, I'm trying to read the whole of the section, but stripped down, so it, it should fit within about half an hour or so. So this is called Fast as Lightning, which some of you may recall, um, maybe or may recognize as a... Um, oh, you know, it's not called Fast as Lightning anymore. It was called Fast as Lightning. It's called Tell It Slant in the book now. But Fast as Lightning it was a quote from um, uh, Kung Fu Fighting, the Carl Douglas hit, which provides uh, an epigraph for the story as well and crops up in it at some point. So, Tell It Slant. Soon it'll be three decades... A ceremony is planned, a memorial, a plaque to be unveiled. It's more than a year away yet, but I already have an invitation to attend, to say a few words, to share my recollections. It lies on my desk. Never forget, it says. Always remember. Keep his memory alive. At the bottom, in smaller font, it also says, Save the day. A typo, though I must have read it three times before I even noticed. Now it's all I can think of, that malapropism. Maybe it's why I've not written back yet to decline, as I've declined all such invitations for years. It's a mistake my father might easily have made anyone of his immigrant generation. I wonder if the letter writer is older or more likely someone still hearing an elder's voice in his head. What do I remember? What does anyone remember after all this time? If you remember it at all, if you were around in the 80s, say, what you remember is a Chinese guy being beaten to death in Detroit by two white auto workers who mistook him for a Japanese. This at the height of the import scare, when Japanese manufacturers were being blamed for the collapse of the big three U.S. auto companies. Maybe you remember it happened outside a club where the Chinese guy, actually a Chinese-American name of Vincent Chin, was celebrating his bachelor party. Maybe you remember he was buried on what should have been his wedding day. But perhaps you thought it was just an urban legend, a bad joke come to life. A Chinaman and a Jew walk into a bar, order drinks, they get to chatting, then out of nowhere the Jew turns around and sucker punches the Chinaman in the face. What the hell was that for, splutters the Chinaman. The Jew goes, Pearl Harbor. But that was the Japanese. I'm Chinese. Oi, sorry, but you know, you've all got the same black hair, the slanty eyes. It was an honest mistake. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Well, all right, the Chinaman says, and they shake and order another round. 
But ten minutes later, the Chinaman rears back and cold cocks the Jew. What the hell was that for, the Jew asks, picking himself up. The Titanic, the Chinaman says. The Titanic, the Jew cries. The Titanic, it was a fucking iceberg. Iceberg, Goldberg, Steinberg, the Chinaman says. Honest mistake. <laughs> Only that night, it wasn't a Chinaman and a Jew. It was two Chinamen. Vincent and me, and it wasn't a bar, but a strip club, and we were with a couple of white friends, Bill and Jerry, but still. I don't know about an honest mistake, but it was an easy one. It was dark in there, filmed with smoke, lit only by the snowy static of glitter balls. One of the girls used a fog machine in her routine, another flickered in a strobe. I'm not sure I could have told Chinese from Japanese in that light, but I knew the pair one silvering, the other mustachioed, across the stage were white, and they knew that we weren't. He wasn't a saint, Vincent, although he always figured he might have been named for one. The newspapers all reported he was there for his bachelor party, and sure, that was the occasion. But bachelor party makes it sound like a one-off, like we took him there, when it was his idea, and a regular haunt of his, his turf, the fancy pants lounge in Highland Park. The girls all knew him. He was a favorite, contrary to the stereotype, which is why I say it, he wasn't a eunuch. The only thing that was different about the, that night then, it was supposed to be his last time. He told me his mother had given him the ultimatum. She knew about the club, his mom, though not his fiancée, Vicky. For her, it was almost as shocking as his death. He'd promised he'd quit going after he married. It's the last time, Ma. I remember because he said she didn't like that, him saying last time. She was superstitious that way, said it was bad luck. Can't win is what he shouted over the music, his breath warm in my ear. Me, I didn't believe him anyway, figured he'd be back the week after the honeymoon. Maybe I even hoped so secretly. It was the first time he'd asked me since I moved home after college, my first time ever in a strip club. I'd dressed preppy, pastel polo over khakis and top sliders. Jerry in his mullet and acid-washed jeans laughed when I got in the car. It's not a disco, man. The girls dance for you, not with you. Ah, lay off him. I was working towards my CPA back then. Vincent had come straight from the restaurant, still in his black slacks and white shirt, but he'd slipped on his members-only jacket. He was riding shotgun, and from the back seat, I watched him spread the wings of his collar in the visor mirror to reveal a thin gold chain. The papers also said what a filial son he was, working two jobs, draftsman by day, waiter by night, to support his poor widowed mother, as well as save for his wedding. They made him out to be a model citizen of the model minority, St. Anne stereotype. But think, that night he must have had 50 bucks in singles on him. Tips, baby. So what exactly was he working so hard for? Two jobs to pay for two lives, maybe. So no saint. Our generation's Bruce Lee, someone's once called him, meaning our generation's tragic martyr. Such an American concept. See Lincoln, Abe, Kennedy's assorted, Dr. King. But Bruce Lee, for all that he was born in the U.S., always felt more Chinese than Chinese-American, and at least as popular with whites and blacks. Plus his death, an allergic reaction to medication, lacked a bad guy. One reason rumors of triad plots or drug abuse, shades of those old Chinatown evils, abounded. But now we had our own martyr. I always wondered how I was supposed to feel about that. I was the friend, after all. Could I have saved him? Should I have died with him? But then he wouldn't be a martyr. Or perhaps we both would be, though martyrs, like most symbols, come best in ones. Instead, I was the witness. In all the newspaper accounts, and now online, if you care to look it up, his friend who ran away. If you can be a friend and run away. Without Bruce Lee, though, would two white men have brought a baseball bat to a fight with an Asian? Had they seen his movies? Did they think they were only being smart, evening the odds against some kung fu fighter? 
Vincent did look a little like Bruce, that same thick mop of coal black hair. So did I, for that matter. We didn't look alike, but we looked like Bruce, more like him than each other, probably. We'd spent our teens practicing his sprung stride and sudden panting punches, flashing his switchblade smile in the mirror. A horse walks into a bar, you know this one? And the bartender asks, why the long face? Yeah, well, how about this one? Two Chinamen walk into a bar, and the barkeep goes, why the same face? Okay, but we weren't the same. That's my point. That's what got him killed. On the one hand, he was more Chinese than me and most of the other Chinese-American kids I knew. He was born there, lived there until he was six before he was adopted, itself pretty rare back then, didn't even speak English in first grade. Then again... His parents didn't live in or around Chinatown like most of ours. They were in Highland Park with no Chinese neighbors. Oh, they came to Chinatown to do their shopping every weekend. I'd see him around, knew who he was. But Highland Park was where he lived, where he went to school, with white kids. Poles, Irish, Italian. This was before the riots and white flight. So he was always more at ease with them. More at ease with them than we were, for sure, but also maybe more at ease with them than with us. That's where he met Bill and Jerry in grade school. I only knew him well in high school. They always had that first claim on him. It's one reason Vincent liked the fancy pants even though it was a rat hole, an old grindhouse with rows of movie seats still in back and the girls up on the stage beneath the peeling gilt proscenium, it meant he got to go back to Highland Park, back home. He'd always hated having to leave, driven out as he saw it. His dad had been mugged so they'd moved to the suburbs and Vincent had finished high school there. They traded a third floor walk up for a nice little ranch with a carport and scalloped aluminium awnings two blocks over from ours. My father talked about Oak Park like it was the promised land, but it never sat right with Vincent. Can't sleep right, he complained. He missed the shush of traffic at night. Really, it felt like running away, I think. He didn't blame his dad. Mr. Chin was an older guy in his 60s by then, but Vincent always figured he'd have fought back if it were him. You could say he'd been spoiling for that fight for years. Irony is, he was a great runner. That was his thing in high school track. I was heavy as a kid, shy in the cafeteria, so I'd take my lunch on the bleachers, watch him doing his laps. I told him running suited his name, and he looked at me blankly. Vincent, I said, means winner. He liked that, as I hoped he would, but it surprised me he hadn't known. Then again, he went by Vince at school, at least, itself unusual among us. Our boys' names, even in English, often echoing the two syllables of a Chinese name, Roland or Robin, Henry or Melvin, Eddie or Albert. Myself, I used to call him Invince, because he was invincible, I told him, but also because he was in, in a way I never could be. Really, I knew Vince just meant American. On the wedding invitation, it was Vincent in embossed italics. Vincent and Victoria, both win- both winners, Vicky and Vince. As a couple, they couldn't have sounded more all-American. They were planning two ceremonies. Vicky had two dresses picked out, one Chinese, one Western. When I asked him that night how the planning was going, he told me his mother was arguing with Vicky over guests throwing rice. She says Chinese don't waste food. She still remembers going hungry during the war. The wedding was planned for a Monday, when all the Chinese restaurants were closed so that everyone could attend. Afterwards, they had tickets for Aruba. His middle name was Jen, though I only learned it when he died. He never used it, and it only shows as a J on his gravestone. I had to ask what it stood for, Jen, the great Confucian virtue of doing unto others as as you'd have them do unto you. So what do I remember? What do you? If you remember the case at all, if you're Asian American, say, you might recall that the killers, Evans and Pitts, father and stepson, pled manslaughter. It was just a barroom brawl gone wrong, heat of the moment stuff, an honest mistake. Never mind it took them 30 minutes to hunt Vincent down. The victim had thrown the first punch after all. They got off with probation and fines of $3,000 each plus court costs. Less than the price of a used car, people said. 
Maybe you remember that the judge had been in a Japanese POW camp during the war. Remember when Chinese couldn't testify against whites, people said, as if it were yesterday and not a hundred years ago. It was Vincent's idea. He told me to run, only he didn't say run, he said scram. It was the last word I heard from him in English, so I've given it a lot of thought. Scram. It's what you say to a kid, isn't it? A nuisance. Or maybe what naughty kids say to each other after they ring a doorbell. Scram. Not run. He was a runner. Running to him meant winning. Running towards something. Scram, I think, meant running away. If he'd said run, we might have both run. But scram was for me. Because he didn't scram. He waited for them. He could have gotten away. When Evans hopped out of the car, a Plymouth for the record, it was still moving. It ran over his foot, for God's sake. It was the Keystone clan out there. You think Vincent couldn't have outrun these guys? He let it in track. But he was done running. He started it at the club after all. He would have fought in the gravel and dog shit parking lot outside too if Evans hadn't gone for the bat. He wanted to fight them. Maybe he thought he could make Evans drop the bat, shame him into a fair fight. Maybe he figured just two on one, they wouldn't feel they needed the bat. This was on Woodward by the McDonald's there. I didn't run far to the edge of the light, just far enough to live, just far enough to watch. Scram. Who was he to tell me to scram? Who was I to listen? He was grappling with pits when Evans caught him on the knees as if reaching for a grounder, after which Vincent couldn't have even, couldn't have run even if he'd wanted. Then a lion drive to the chest as he went down, two more to the head when he was on all fours, swinging for the fences. I did run back, but too late. Vincent's last words, it's not fair, to me, in Chinese, while I cradled his ruined head, blood bubbling from his mouth and nose as he spoke, blood pouring from his ears like oil, his skull felt like rotten fruit. The blow to the chest broke a jade charm Vincent wore on his chain, a bad omen to Chinese, so you hardly needed an omen to, fore- to foretell what was coming next. The ambulance took him to Henry Ford Hospital, the same hospital he used to take his dad for dialysis, where he lingered for a few days, his mother by his bedside, calling him, Vincent, Mama coming, Vincent, as if from a great distance, before she finally gave consent to turn him off. The same hospital where they told her 30 years earlier that she'd never have a child. If you remember the case at all, and maybe it's coming back to you, if you were watching TV back then, you might recall her, Vincent's mother, Lily, going on Donahue, remember him? Or meeting with Jesse Jackson, remember him? At one of his presidential campaign rallies. She put the yellow in the rainbow coalition, people said. She still had one of those comedy, chinglish accents. What I live for, I don't have happy anymore. I not care my life. The kind of accent that makes my generation cringe. Vincent used to do a choice imitation of it, but her voice cracked, daring anyone to laugh, daring anyone to feel embarrassed. Very hurt my heart. Lily. But Mrs. Chin, to me, always, just another mom, but stouter, shriller, fiercer, and more doting than all the rest, so that she seemed somehow like everyone's mother. Everyone else's. Mine had died of ovarian cancer before I turned seven. When we were kids, she always had treats, egg tarts, mooncakes in fall, her homemade prawn crackers, and praised my good appetite. When we grew up, she was always asking when I was going to get married, telling Vincent to introduce me to some girl, to which he would roll his eyes, though whether for her benefit or mine, I was never quite sure. All I learned about her life came from the newspapers. Some of it I doubt even Vincent knew. She'd grown up in Canton. Her family owned a department store. They must have been well off. But they lost it all in the war. She'd come from China in 47 to marry his dad, who'd lived here since the 20s and earned his citizenship by enlisting. Mrs. Chin's own father had resisted the match. An ancestor had worked on the railroads and been driven out. But she was sure it would be a better life. She'd seen so much violence in China at the hands of the Japanese, she wanted to start over. She'd have been 27 old to marry, delayed by the war, and Vincent's dad even older at 44. I guess they tried to start a family of their own, but she miscarried and the docs told her she couldn't have kids. 
It took them more than a decade to adopt Vincent from Hong Kong. His dad was in his late, in his late 50s by then, and even Lily in her 40s, the oldest parents of anyone I knew. They worked their whole lives in laundries and restaurants. For what? Vincent asked me savagely during his father's final in illness. They never had any fun. We were outside in his drive, smoking. Mrs. Chin framed in the kitchen window, intently washing rice as if panning for gold. I knew what it was to lose a parent. I had come to pay my respects. I didn't know his father well. What I remembered most is his sure-handed ability to pluck out a fish's eyeball with chopsticks, a deafness which impressed me as a child almost as much as his relish in eating it appalled me. But I knew the answer to Vincent's question. For what? For you. It was the same for all of us kids, the debt he could never redeem, no matter how late he sat up rubbing the old man's swollen knuckles when he couldn't sleep. First his dad, and now Vincent himself. Part of what was so moving was that his mother's desire for justice, her thirst for vengeance, they were ways of forgiving his most unfilial act, dying before her besides which sneaking off to strip clubs under Vicky's nose was a pale betrayal. The night it happened, when I finally got home from the hospital and told my father everything, he pulled me close and hugged me. I couldn't remember the last time we'd touched. I had failed my friend, I understood, but been a good son. They called themselves the ACJ. American Citizens for Justice. No mention of Chinese or Asian in the name, and insisted that the placards at marches be in English, which may explain the painful, plaintive pun of chin up for justice on one popular sign. But they're the ones, journalists, lawyers, church leaders, local businessmen, who helped Lily get the case reopened. And they're coming together, Chinese and Japanese, those old enemies, as well as Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, marked the start of a pan-Asian political movement. And me, along with the rest, attending meetings, giving interviews, marching beneath a neatly lettered sign. You could say it's when we became Asian American. Two drunk white guys couldn't tell us apart, and we realized we were more alike than we'd thought. The first meetings were held in the Golden Star, the restaurant where Vincent worked, everyone sitting around the fresh laid tables, plastic tablecloths and melamine rice bowls, trying not to disturb the settings, looking less angry or sad in that context than hungry. It reminded me of his funeral the previous summer, only these weren't all the same people who'd come then. I didn't know many of them, many of them didn't know Vincent, and yet they spoke of that night as if they had been there, as if they'd been attacked. In a way, I guess, they felt they had, if not by Evans, then by the verdict. Part of me wanted to say something. Didn't they know who I was, that I had been there? But then it came to me that all their talk of a heinous assault, a brutal slaying, wasn't the way you'd talk about it if you were there. That wasn't how I remembered it. It was how they imagined it. They weren't talking as if they'd been there, but as if they wished they had been. What would they have done if they had been? I wondered, and I held my peace. It reminded me of Vincent, the way he told me about his father's mugging. They were spoiling for a fight, too. Back in the kitchen, I remember the cooks were preparing dishes for later, hot oil singing in the steel walks. I didn't say anything in the end, but Lily was there, and she spoke last, halting but firm. She wanted justice for Vincent, and we applauded until our hands stung. But a lot of the people in that room also wanted justice for themselves. Me too, I suppose. I had failed my friend, but maybe there was still something I could do. Don't make a federal case out of it. Wasn't that the Chinese-American way? Turn the other cheek, look the other way, water off a Peking duck's back. Take it on the chin, as a sick joke doing the rounds had it. But making a federal case is literally what we did. What we had to do to get the case reopened and prosecuted by the Justice Department as a hate crime. Only it had never been done before. Civil rights legislation hadn't been applied to Asians previously. Doing so now was a hot topic, a choice. Whose lot to throw in with? Blacks for whom the legislation had been written, some of whom were suspicious of a possible usurpation or dilution as if Asian struggles were equivalent, or whites, whom many of us aspired to be like. 
I sat at the back of those meetings between the payphone and the cigarette machine. Every so often the talk would be interrupted, hushed really, by someone trying to come in to eat. The irritated exchanges at the door when they were turned away. I couldn't see from where I was, but I imagined they were probably white. It was that kind of a restaurant, the kind where white diners point out the few Chinese to each other and whisper how the food must be authentic. I wondered what they thought if they glimpsed a crowd of Chinese inside before the door shut on them. As to our question, were we a minority or were we honorary members of the majority, I reckon I know what Vincent would have chosen, Vince. But to get justice for him, we chose the other. Later I heard some blacks call us freedom riders. What they meant was free riders. So, a federal case. And I was called to testify, to say what I'd heard, what I'd seen, what I'd done, what I remembered. It was a race thing, no doubt. One of the strippers, Lacey, remembered the line, and then we all did. It's because of you little motherfuckers we're out of work, Evans said. Meaning Japanese, even though he wasn't out of work himself, even though Vincent wasn't Japanese. But okay. The car business was in the crapper, as Vincent very well knew. He was working for an auto supplier, after all. He was in the business. Would it have made a difference if Vincent had said, I'm Chinese, that his mother had moved to the U.S. because she couldn't live in China after the war with her memories of the Japanese bombing? Probably not. Nips, chinks, gooks, slants, we were all the same to them. Instead, he said, I'm not a little motherfucker. And Evans came back with drunken magnanimity. Big fucker, little fucker, we're all fuckers. And then Vincent stubbed out his cigarette and went for him. Punches were thrown. A stool. Pitts had his head cut open. I'm not a motherfucker, he said. And he wasn't. But it's the word that set him off, I think, more than the race thing even. That we heard every day, anyhow. But he didn't like motherfucker. He was an adoptee. His father had died less than a year earlier. He still lived at home, and he was about to get married. He didn't like that word. It's unfilial, okay? Disrespectful. We worship our ancestors. I asked him once about his birth parents, and he said he didn't know. Dead, he figured, or unmarried, or so poor they had to sell him or give him away. He'd come from Hong Kong, so they might have been refugees from the communist mainland. I don't know what I expected. I might have been probing for vulnerability, looking for an opening to express sympathy. But this was the opposite of self-pity. I feel bad for them, but it's not like I remember them. What if they'd kept him, I pressed. And he shrugged. That kid wouldn't have been me. Couldn't have been. I read somewhere once that in China, during the Cultural Revolution, they called bashing someone's brains in, opening the flower. I wonder sometimes about the odd echoes. An adoptee and his mother, a father and a stepson. Perhaps they all had something to prove. Evans did say, I was just defending my boy. He was a superintendent at Chrysler when Pitts had been laid off. Maybe he felt he owed him. Maybe he loved him like his own. They still played baseball together is why they had the bat in the trunk in the first place. Turns out Evans only took Pitts to the club that night because the boy had just had a fight with his girlfriend. And the day after, the only day either of them ever woke up in a cell, Father's Day. Vincent was my friend, so how could I leave him? He was my friend, but I didn't always like him. How could I not envy his confidence, his good looks, his fiancée? Even afterwards, I hated him a little. Even in death, he made me feel like nothing, worse than nothing, a coward. Oh, it wasn't right, those two getting off for killing him. But that's not why I testified. I wanted to stand up, even if belatedly. I felt like the guilty party. So I met with Tina, the young Chinese lawyer, and Jerry and Bill around a cigarette-burned table. And she told us, you need to get your lines down. Agree on what happened. Get your stories straight. I remember touching my fingertip to each scorch mark in turn. Tina was slim and a little severe, but her long hair shone like Vicky's. Vincent would have called her fine, found a way to make her smile. And that's when we remembered the racist talk, heard by all of us above the throbbing music, clearly recalled despite all the booze we'd drunk. And Vincent's last words? 
heard only by me, spoken in Chinese so no one else could understand, never mind that his head was already stove in, jaw shattered, and people wondered how he could even have retained consciousness, let alone spoken? Well, okay. But it wasn't fair, was it? None of it. Tell me that's not true. What did I do? What would you have done? Evan's got 25 years. Out the courtroom window, I watched a jet slowly raise a scar across the sky. What is truth, anyway? What I testified, this version, what you can read in the papers or online, Chinese whispers, you might say. Vincent, incidentally, wanted to be a lawyer when he was a kid. His mother told him no one would believe a Chinese lawyer. He wanted to be a writer, too, but she told him he'd never make any money at it. By the time I told him he was thinking about, by the, by the time I knew him, he was thinking about being a vet, but she reminded him he was scared of blood. He was my friend. But did I like him, or was I just like him? Maybe, just maybe, if you remember the case at all, if you saw the Oscar-winning documentary or studied it in school or read a blog about it, you'll recall that Evans's federal conviction was later appealed. Lacey's testimony was called into doubt had she received consideration for other charges. And the witnesses' testimonies, our testimony, our memory, by this time five years had passed since that night, was challenged. We'd been coached by our Chinese lawyer, they said. What did I remember? When did I remember it? I don't know. The air conditioning was blasting in court, but my shirt was sticking to me like a band-aid. What if I didn't want to remember that night? Did anyone think of that? Maybe you remember the conviction was overturned on appeal. Afterwards, I couldn't bear to face her, Lily, Mrs. Chin, but she couldn't bear, and she couldn't bear to stay in the U.S. She already had her ticket back to China when the first verdict came out, but it only delayed things. She finally went back, 40 years after she left, went home, some might say, to Canton, though by then it was called Guangzhou. She used to say she couldn't remain in a land of injustice, but I always thought it was the vicious ironies that drove her out. She'd left China, after all, to escape her memories of the Japanese invasion, only to have her son killed because he was mistaken for a Japanese, and then to make common cause with Japanese-Americans in her search for justice. Toyota... Datsun, Honda, Pearl Harbor went a popular Detroit bumper sticker back in the day. Ten years after Vincent's death, Lee Iacocca, Chrysler's president and pitchman, was still complaining that the Japanese were, quote, beating our brains in. Recently, I read Buick was a bestseller in China. I wonder how Mrs. Chin might have felt seeing American cars on the roads there. She lived in China another 20 years but came back to the U.S. for cancer treatment at the end of her life. The Asian-American Rosa Parks, the obits called her. She's buried between Vincent and his father. They asked me to her funeral, too, as they've asked me faithfully to anniversaries and conferences and rallies down the years, as they've asked me to this latest memorial. I appreciate the sentiment. They forgive me for lying or not lying well enough either way. If only I could forgive myself. But it's too late for the truth now. You can't say all this stuff at an unveiling in a documentary or an interview. You can't say all this when someone calls you a motherfucker. I RSVP'd my regrets this morning. I can't and never could save the day. Lily used to say, Vincent still be live if I hadn't adopted him. I should have talked to her. We were the two who felt most guilty, the ones who most wanted someone else to pay. This afternoon, at least, I went to her grave, all their graves, cleaned the stones, left oranges, and lit joss, thought of my own father long retired to Florida. The sod over Vincent and his dad is a shade greener than that over his mother's more recent plot, like jade that darkens from wearing. Sometimes I wonder if anything might have been different if I had not gone along that night. Different for me, of course, how I've wished I was never there, but also for him. I'd never been to the fancy pants with him before, but I'd heard about it. It was one reason I jumped at the chance. Why hadn't he asked me along before? He'd taken Jerry and Bill. He might have been worried I'd blab, tell mutual friends that it'd get back to Vicky, I guess, but it's not like he didn't brag about it. No. I think it was something else. I wasn't as cool as him, you might say, and I wasn't, but really, any Chinese is less cool alongside another. Maybe we lose our exoticism. More likely, it's that alone we can define ourselves. With another, we invite all the stereotypes. 
Alone, or especially with Jerry or Bill, he was Vince. With me alongside, he was Vincent, Asian. So I have to ask, would Evans have called us names if there'd only been one of us? It's because of you, he meant, he said, and he meant you, plural. One isn't a threat, two or more, well, we were them. And would Vincent have gotten so angry if I hadn't been there? Perhaps, probably, but just maybe he felt he had to represent, to answer back. He knew I wouldn't. Later, when the bouncers intervened, I even tried to apologize to Evans, play peacemaker. So Vincent may have figured it fell to him to uphold our honor, even to protect me. And then again, maybe he just didn't want to be like me. Maybe he yelled back through the first punch to prove we weren't the same. I'm not a motherfucker, he said. He didn't say, we are not. There's a name for it, okay, this idea we all look alike. It's been studied, documented, cross-race bias, they call it. It's true of how whites see blacks, even how other races see whites. But with Asians, the sameness is magnified. There are so many of us squeezed together in our overcrowded cities, and we all have the same names and dress alike, wear glasses. I kept mine on to look at the girls. Vincent wore contacts. Even the things we make are copies, cheap knockoffs, poor imitations. We may all look alike. Like. But when we try to copy you, well, the differences are obvious. And if they're not, it just means we're getting trickier not to be trusted. Maybe to Evans and Pitts, Vincent was just a pale imitation. Maybe the reason they killed him is not because he was like me, but because he was trying to be like them. If I had a gun, I'd shoot you now, I told Evans while we waited for the ambulance. But I didn't, of course. And what about all the other what-ifs? Ten thousand of them, as Evans said. What if none of us had gone that night, or not gotten so drunk, not cared what a couple of assholes said? What if I hadn't run? And what if the judge locked those guys up at the first trial? What if justice was seen to be done? Vincent is still dead. Lily still goes back to China. Vicky is still alone. I'm still yellow. It's a tragedy, but a small one, forgotten in time. But the verdict... Those paltry fines, that's what made travesty of tragedy. Shit, it's a toss-up which was more racist, the crime or the verdict. But it's the injustice that lives on, the unfairness that ensures that Vincent's death will be remembered. And alongside it, always and forever, my cowardice, like a baseline, a footnote, minor but essential, his friend who ran away. Martyrs and saints, you see, they have to be brave. Otherwise, they're just victims. Vincent could have run away. That's what my life proves. He chose not to. Never mind that he should have run. He had a mother to care for, a wife to live for. Never mind that he was a hothead who didn't give any more thought to his loved ones that he ha- than he had in the club. No, he stood up before he was knocked down, and I ran. Yin to his yang, if you want to fit it in a fortune cookie. He's a symbol now. His prom picture on t-shirts and posters, his name a rallying cry, and yet he can't symbolize me. For him to mean what he means, he and I have to be different. As the old joke goes, two Chinamen going down the street, one of them walks into a club, the other one ducks. Yeah, not funny? Maybe it's the way I tell them. Yellow, by the way, is what whites call us, of course, and mean it as a slur, skin color, symbolizing character. But in fact, Chinese started calling ourselves that first, way back around the time of the Opium Wars, to distinguish ourselves from white and black, when the connotations to us, the Yellow Emperor, the Yellow River, were positive. We'd been sitting outside the McDonald's on Woodward, perched on a raised planter made of old railroad ties, our panting turning to laughter. We thought we'd lost them. Your face when he pulled out that bat. I thought I was going to shit myself, okay? It was becoming a story. I could see us telling it at the wedding. I could see us joking about it for years to come, and it was just the two of us, something we'd always share. Evans and Pitts had ignored Jerry and Bill after all. They only chased us. We sat shoulder to shoulder, sharing a smoke. In a minute, I was going to suggest a Big Mac and fries. Vincent was likely going to counter with a coney dog from the Red Hots up the block, another old haunt. Saturday night, 10-something, sidewalks still warm from the sun. Six lanes of traffic came and went in the intersection before us, exhaust rising redly in the taillights. First car in Detroit drove down this street, he said. 
first mile of concrete paving in the country, I recited, from some high school field trip. First assembly line rolled them right out over there. My dad used to bring me down here to watch the cruising when I was a kid, teach me the names of all the marks. He could still remember the streetcars running. Now I can remember when it was all elms along here. But the last time I'd seen him, I realized it was at his father's funeral. I don't even want a Jap car, he said. It'd be like a Jew buying a Beamer. Me either. What would you drive if you could have any car? I actually wanted an Audi, but what I said was Trans Am. Sally Field in the passenger seat, he teased. You always liked them pony cars. What about you? Cars were stopping in the intersection again. Porsche, man. Black 911 Turbo Carrera. What else? We were still laughing when they spotted us. Sitting there and laughing, Evans said in court, it must have been real funny to them. A joke at his expense, I guess he figured. I haven't bought an American car in 30 years. I've never been to a baseball game. I have been back to a strip club once. The night after the final acquittal, this was in Cincinnati, Evans's lawyers had successfully petitioned for a change of venue. It would be impossible to get a fair trial in Detroit after all the publicity about the case. Interviews Lily had given, they argued, were prejudicial, even though publicity was the only reason the case had gotten reopened in the first place. At jury selection, I'd heard fewer than 10% of possible Cincinnati jurors said they'd ever met an Asian American. The place was called Sin City. Nicer than the fancy pants, it smelled of Windex and warm vinyl, a chemical new car with, but I figured I could still get in trouble there. I was the one spoiling for a fight now, fantasizing about Evans and Pitts walking in to celebrate, tightening my grip on the neck of my beer, feeling the pulse in my fist. I watched the girls. One reminded me a little of Lacey, and I watched the men watching them, but no one seemed to notice me. The mood was mild, sappy even, worn, lonely men in rumpled sport coats, eyes wide and watery from drink, grinning like kids on Christmas. I wondered, could that have been Vincent if he'd lived? Lacey had said he was always smiling. By contrast, I was the one sour puss in there, and the girls seemed to know to steer clear. If anyone was going to start something in there, it was going to be me. But I realized after a while I'd simply be too embarrassed to make a scene. The rowdiest it got was some joker waving his lighter in the air, shouting, Free bird! until a bouncer shushed him primly, a finger to his lips. The crowd was mostly white, the bouncers all black, the girls a mix. Even one Asian girl dancing to turning Japanese, a euphemism for masturbation, so I'd heard that it might have been BS. She came out like a geisha, mincing in a shiny kimono. By the end, she was wearing, all she was wearing was white makeup and bright red lipstick. I found myself blushing for her, as I thought, unable to watch except out of the corner of my eye. But then I realized I was ashamed for myself, praying she wouldn't see me come over, expose me. She couldn't have made me out in the gloom, I told myself. We men must have just been a constellation of cigarette tips from the stage. Thirty minutes later, she did another set, this one in a sleek black wig, to China Girl, and this time I did study her, her face, trying to decide. Toward the end of her set, when she was naked, she met my eyes, and I realized she'd known I was there all along, had seen me during her first set or from backstage. Afterwards, she came up to me at the bar, wrapped in a short robe, nipples showing through like rivets. I shivered, reminded of how chilled the place was. Don't I know you, hun? I swallowed my drink, shook my head, made to leave, but she put her hand on my arm. What's your name? Vincent. It just came out in my panic. I must, might have flinched, but she'd n if she noticed, it was only because she was used to people lying. Well, Vinny, I'm Cindy. Want to buy me a drink? Can I ask, are you Chinese or Japanese? Whatever you want me to be, baby. No, really, tell me. You want to guess, she asked, still teasing. No. Okay, baby, okay. She was calculating, I thought, trying to decide what I wanted to hear, even though I didn't even know myself. And something else. She was as reluctant to reveal herself as she'd, as she'd be to tell me her real name. And suddenly, I didn't want her to have to lie. It's fine, I told her, finishing my drink. It doesn't matter. But she smiled, put a hand on my arm. All American, baby. We're all American here. 
It felt like something to cover ourselves in, that word, its warm anonymity, and I nodded, sank back on my stool, bought her that drink. Thank you. I wish you heard, my friends, this is a man who has a marvelous way with words. And it's just the, the British accent. It's just an accent. <laughs> well, there is that, the beautiful sense. posh accent. Yeah. But, but no, you do, and, and you read so well, because not all authors read their own works uh, so beautifully. But what Peter does, there are four stories, and the longest story was um, in the uh, mid-19th century, the story of this uh, man who came from China to work on the railroads, mm -hmm. and he manages to become quite successful, but uh, through a lot of struggles. And then there's the story of Anna Mae Wong as we move forward in history in the early 1900s, and she's quite successful as a film star, but she could have been more successful mm -hmm. had she been white, arguably. Then you included the story of Vincent Chun that you just read us. And then finally, it's uh, someone who, an American who's half Chinese, is that half right? Chinese, half yeah. Chinese, um, and mother from Hong Kong, as I remember. Uh, Singapore. Right? Or from, yeah. Okay, yeah. and, and um, who is in uh, China today to adopt a, a, a Chinese uh, a girl, um, as this uh, has become so, so common lately. So you take us through um, two um, centuries of the Chinese American experience, and I wonder, this is your fourth book, not your first mm -hmm. book, and I know you don't, necessarily identify yourself with your Chinese heritage mm -hmm. that much, but there's a part of you that does, after all, yeah. on your mother's side. Um, why write this book at this time, <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, yeah, and, and why wait un until now to do it? That's a great question, um, and I hope I have a good answer for it. I will, <laughs> we'll find out in a minute. Um, I think situationally where this novel comes from um, is it's a response, even a kind of companion piece to my last novel, which is a novel called The Welsh Girl, uh, set in North Wales during World War II. So it would seem as though they're very different books, very odd, uh, odd books, an odd pairing. But because my heritage is half Welsh on my father's side, half Chinese on my mother's side, um, The Welsh Girl was written out of an interest in identity. Uh, it was written not because I feel confidently Welsh, but because I feel uncertain of my claim to Welshness and uncertain of my relationship to Welshness. I was not so much writing what I know, but sort of writing into what I wasn't quite sure of. Um, and the book ended up being a, an effort on my part to understand my relationship to Welsh identity and to Welshness in some ways. And having done that for that side of my heritage, it felt fairly natural, not just to keep peace in my parental home, uh, that I turned to the, my mother's side of the family and think about my relationship to uh, Chineseness in various ways. Um, you know, so the books seem heterogeneous in many ways, but they have that question, that engagement with identity, the question that we might construe as do I belong and how do I belong and in what ways have I inherited something from one side or inherited something from another side. Um, so that, that was really the motivation for that. But there's a larger question, I think. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer to it, but I, I'm interested in the question that lies behind this issue, um, which sometimes goes to the, the issue of um, what we expect certain writers to write. Right? And so I work with a number of um, uh, young writers of color at the MFA program, some Asian Americans, some African American, whatever they might be, and some of mixed parentage. Right? Um, and there's sometimes, I think, a question for them of, am I supposed to write about the people and the place that I come from? Um, and that can feel like their natural material, but it can also feel like a strange obligation, almost mm -hmm. a stereotypical obligation. You're black, you should be writing about black people. Mm -hmm. You're an Asian, you should be writing about Asians. Um, you're an immigrant, you should be writing about the immigrant experience. And while I think many great pieces of work come from that space, uh, any writer who's feels an obligation to write something, anybody who feels that there is an expectation from an audience that they, they should do a certain thing, um, anybody worth their salt is apt to say, screw that, I want to write what I want to write, right? to push back on that space. We are, uh, almost by definition, somewhat oppositional, I think, in certain ways. Um, so I, I want to, I think I got lucky in some ways. I know Asian American writers who sometimes feel hemmed in by their identity, that they're expected to write more Asian American novels. My friend Chang Rei Lee has a wonderful novel called The Loft, uh, I think his third book, that features a, um, an Italian-American protagonist as its main character, um, mm -hmm. based, as I happen to know, somewhat on his father-in-law. Um, <laughs> 
And in fact, the only Asian American characters in that book is very loosely, very slightly, and in one small detail at least, based upon me. Um, mm. But that book of his, although I think it's a wonderful book, I feel didn't quite compute for readers. Why is this guy, this Korean American guy, who already published two books dealing with Korean American identity in various ways, writing a book about an Italian American? Um, so, did any of that inform the fact that I came more lately to writing about Chinese identity? I'm not sure, not consciously, but maybe somewhere in the back of my mind, maybe. And you started with um, the Chinese who helped build the railroads out mm -hmm. west in the 19th century, and originally was, you told me it was just going to be about that, and then you expanded it, I think, blessedly, to you know, the span uh, American history and the Chinese-American uh, experience. But, uh, why railroad workers? <laughs> uh, because after I, I was talking about this with some people this afternoon, um, so I've lived in the US now for about 25 years. Within a couple of years of getting here, I took a cross-country train ride from Boston to San Francisco. Mm. Uh, I was a student and not very wealthy, so I did not have a cabin. I just had a chair. <laughs> and you have a very big country, as it turns out, mm -hmm. and it just goes on and on and on. And it, it feels like a particularly big and large country when you're sitting in a chair for four days. Oh, um, and I th but I think in a way it was very useful for me as a European, right? Our concept of what a country is is smaller, more homogeneous, sense, I think, in some ways. So to get that sense of the continental scale of the US in my bones, almost literally, was instructive to me. And I learned on that journey, at the very end of that journey, as we go over the Sierras and down into San Francisco, um, and you have that movement from the snow-capped Sierras down into the sort of the, the tropical plains with the palm trees as you're entering into, into the, the, the flatlands of California. Um, that was the end of the journey, which I welcomed, but I also learned in that passage that the Chinese had built the rails over the terrain, uh, which is very shocking, very striking terrain. And something about the idea that there were Chinese building this railroad from what, west towards the center of the country to meet in Utah, Irish immigrants largely building from the east or the Midwest towards the center of the country. Um, because of that interesting mixture of my own background, Chinese and Welsh, here we have the Chinese and my Celtic brother in the Irish meeting in the middle, that immediately appealed to me as material. Uh, uh, I wasn't ready to write it then. I didn't know this country well enough. I wasn't an experienced enough writer to do it. So it went on the back burner for a while. Um, and, you know, there came a point when I felt ready and I also felt like I had a way in to the material. One of the things that's interesting, though, and one of the things that I like to think about now in regard to the transcontinental is it's built in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Um, it's an act, I think, almost literally of nation building. This is a thing, mm -hmm. this huge civil engineering project that is going to stitch east and west together uh, in the years immediately after a conflict which has threatened to tear north and south apart, right? So it feels mm -hmm. as though it is uh, a 19th century equivalent of nation building, which is, of course, a very 20th and 21st century concept, and it's an act of nation building engaged in entirely just about by immigrant labor. Right? So that seems like an interesting way to think about something to put the country together after its greatest strife built by immigrants. Now, in the mid-19th century, the Chinese faced incredible prejudice um, we didn't want to let um, Chinese men bring their, their wives sure. over here, bring women. And then um, by the 1880s, early, 19, mm -hmm. uh, early uh, 1880s, there was this backlash, the Chinese are stealing our jobs, which sounds sure. very familiar right. today. And then uh, the Exclusion Act was passed, and, and we allowed no Chinese immigration mm -hmm. for something like 60 years until right. after World War II. Um, as you progress through your book and tell these um, three stories based on true historical people, although with your imagining what's going on internally and, and doing it very brilliantly, and then um, up to the modern era. You do see the progression, however, in the prejudice against Asians becomes gradually less, and of course, th there has, has been a lot of progress made mm -hmm. in this country toward accepting people of different races. We may be backtracking now um, uh, recently, but, but at least there's been this, this progress since early Civil Rights Act passed in 1964. What has your experience been, Peter, first mm -hmm. growing up half Chinese in, in, in Great Britain, and then coming to the United States, living here now for, for two and a half decades. Um, have you personally uh, met very many obstacles by being hmm. part Chinese? Are there certain assumptions made about you, certain, uh, certain obstacles wow. and prejudices you face? That's a fascinating question, um, and a large one. Um, there's so many things I might address. You know, so, you, know you mentioned um, 
the Chinese after the building of the transcontinental becoming subject to racism because they are taking jobs, right? And the great irony of that is they build a railroad that allows the influx of white labor into California, and that's why they're taking jobs, because they, it created a space where the labor market suddenly grew, and it grew with, you know, nativist labor, I think, in some ways. So there's a wrapped together irony involved in that space. Um, you know, mostly in my life, I would say, and actually I would argue, particularly after I came to the U.S., I felt less of a, a, a burden of race, a sting of discrimination, the edge of that. Um, uh, when I was growing up in Britain, and I've been thinking about this time uh, more of late, uh, in the late 70s, the early 80s, it was a period in Britain uh, when I think and this has been going on with Britain in several post-war decades, we were still grappling very much with the end of empire. We were in an end of empire mode. One of the manifestations of that was a rise of um, far-right parties, and in Britain, in my youth, the National Front. Mm. So those images we have of skinheads with swastikas, you know, tattooed on their foreheads, is coming out of that space, right? And so I can remember as a child, uh, my father, who uh, was white and was fairly protective of me in these regards, saying, you can't go and play soccer in that field because there's a National Front march coming through town at that time. And I would always like, well, they're not going to bother me, it's going to be fine. Uh, but he was watchful. Right? Yeah. Um, but also very protective. I remember he told me years after it had happened that there had been um, racist graffiti spray-painted on our garage door um, that as soon as he'd seen it when he came home from work, he'd painted over it. I never saw it. I never even knew it had happened or existed uh, until years later. Right? So there was a distinct sense of protectiveness in that regard. So um, one of the memories that has been coming back to me sadly very recently of that time is walking with my father down a busy shopping street in my home city of Coventry um, and seeing some guys running through, young guys, teenagers, a little bit older than me, I would have been about 12 or 13, uh, running through that shopping area. And one of them uh, was a, wearing a turban, he was a Sikh guy, uh, he was out in front. I still, in my childlike conception of this, thought, well, these guys are just racing somewhere, they're late, <laughs> I don't know, they're playing a game. Uh, until, of course, the guys chasing pull the Sikh guy to the ground and stick the boot in. Right? Um, it's all happening very fast. Lots of people, it's a busy, it's a Saturday afternoon on a shopping street. Lots of people are just standing there looking at this. And I'm not saying that those people had even yet made the, the connection of if I get involved, I too could be on the ground getting kicked, right? There wasn't the people, I don't think, were conceptualizing. They weren't even reading what was happening in front of them. Um, and I know I wasn't, but my father was. And so my father waded in, pulled these guys off, pushed them away, picked this kid up, kicked mm. this, got this other guy out of the way. Um, and, uh, and I think it's partly because he was ready for that moment. And he was ready for that moment because he was waiting for that moment to happen to me, right? Mm. So he was prepared for that. Um, and we, we never really talked about race, right? Um, but it's interesting to think about that watchfulness on his part. That I, now that I'm a father myself, I understand that watchfulness. Um, a little bit. So I've been thinking about that. So, that. so that's my youth. That's that background that I can think of, right? Uh, I can think of always standing out. I can think of feeling I would stand at a bus stop in my hometown, a bus, uh, you know, a line, because it was a queue in Britain, um, of only white people and feeling in my largely white town that I want to be polite and well-behaved and upstanding and all those good things so that these people will have a good impression of every colored person they ever meet or think about or hear about. It's a ridiculous burden, ridiculous for an eight-year-old, ridiculous for anybody to feel that. Um, but I was sensitized in those ways. Um, so, the calendar pages fall from the wall and I pitch up in the US. I'm in my 20s, mid-20s, um, go to Boston. Um, and I sort of still have encoded this idea that I walk into a room and I'm read as Asian. Right? And that happens in the US as well, of course. But one of the things that's really interesting to me is that as soon as I open my mouth and this accent comes out of it, <laughs> people who are trying to read me one way, oh, he's Asian, oh, now what the, what the hell do I do with this accent? How do I match that up, right? So, so this goes to that. I, I think the broader question here is it goes to an issue that I'm interested in very interested in the book, it's the issue of stereotypes, right? Um, and one of the things that you feel when there's a stereotype is that somebody sees you and knows you. 
They see you and they read you instantly. Mm -hmm. um, they know something about you. And I would argue that one of the horrifying things about stereotype is not that they are false, but that they often contain some small kernel of truth. They could be true. So they know you and they know some true part about you. Um, and what was great about coming to the US and having people see me in that frame through that stereotypical lens, or at least my perception that they were seeing me in that way, was that as soon as I opened my mouth, I could see myself blowing up that stereotype. I blew up that frame. And so it felt that that was a way of getting out from under the possibility of that stereotype. It was very freeing in those ways. Um, so it felt in that sense that uh, most of the time that I've lived in the US, my sense of how I look has always felt like an interesting cloak. It's not who I am, it's who you think I am. And I also know that I'm not necessarily the person that people think I am. Mm -hmm. So that's been interestingly freeing to me. Um, so that's a roundabout answer to your question. The, the one thing I would return to, I've been talking about this with some of my uh, own students in Ann Arbor lately. Um, when I have been thinking back recently, uh, to that moment of seeing that Sikh boy pulled down and beaten up on the streets of my hometown in the early 80s. Um, I also thought about what else was going on in the 80s, and it was bringing back that era, that nostalgic moment to me. It's not a fond memory, but it's that era I suppose coming back to me. And um, for some reason, I thought of the music of that period. Maybe it's because I'm also thinking of, you know, these are skinheads and punks. This is that era. And I thought of a band. I mean, where I came from, there were some, uh, some bands like... Uh, you know, the, the, bands like The Clash were very popular back then. So this sort of punkish sensibility, tough, white, working class bands. But these were also the bands that were at the forefront of the Rock Against Racism movement. Right? Mm. And it has been uh, interesting and heartening to me to think that in my lifetime, and of course this is not the lifetime of my students or their direct experience, but in my lifetime at least, there was a alignment of white working class and people of color and immigrants in Britain, right? The, and I always felt as a child, you know, there were plenty of tough skinheads that I would kind of slink by in the town center, but I always kind of thought, well, you know, I have this tough white guy, and his name is Joe Strummer, and he's the lead singer of The Clash, and he has my back, right? Mm -hmm. So the toughest white guy on the block, he's with me, right? So that was an interesting way of thinking about that. And so we're, we're in a space where we think a lot about uh, racial division, different groups, and some of that can feel inevitable, and I think my own experience suggests that's not inevitable, that that's situational for our particular moment in time. Thanks for listening. Thank you also to our many sponsors, African and African Diaspora Studies at Calvin College, Ambrose at WIMCAT, the Asian Studies Program at Calvin College, Brazos Press, the Calvin Center for Community Engagement and Global Learning, the Calvin College Campus Store, the Calvin College Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, the Calvin College History Department, the Calvin College Office of the Provost, the Calvin College Department of Sociology and Social Work High-Ends Fund, the Calvin College Student Life Division, the Calvin Theater Company, the Christian Reformed Church's Office of Social Justice, event and tech services at Calvin College, the Paul B. Henry Institute at Calvin College, and Schuler Books and Music. You can find more recordings from the 2016 Fall Writer Series and learn more about the work of the Calvin Center for Faith and Writing at our website, ccfw.calvin.edu.